Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable, PRT for short. My name is Josh Turner, also known as Wolf. And with me as always, oh wait, today I have a different co-host. My co-host is... Me, Nellie. Me, me Nellie. Is that <laughs> me, Nellie? Okay, so <laughs> Nellie, Nelly, my wife, is going to be my co-host tonight. And uh, we're going to get into some some uh, crazy stuff, some creepy stuff. But first, I want to give you our email address, doswolfman88 at gmail.com, doswolfman88 at gmail.com. One more time for good measure, doswolfman88 at gmail.com. Uh, our, po- our podcast uh, is PRT Podcast. That's our website address, prtpodcast.com, prtpodcast.com. One more time, prtpodcast.com. People say that I don't say I, they can't get it or whatever. There it is three times. You can go there. There's art submission. There's all the back episodes are on that website. In the archives, we have uh, merchandise that you can buy to support the show. You can help support the show. T-shirts. We have book bags. We have sweatshirts. We have all kinds of stuff. Check it out, guys. Uh, and and if you want to support the show, that's a good way to do it. And also to wear the uh, merchandise and, you know, Put the advertising out there. Walk around, you know, advertising. Somebody asks you what that is, tell them it's part of a cult and that you're in it. And so (laughs) so, uh, I have to say this. I'm just joking. Everybody always says, why do you say that? Well, I have to say that because some people have chastised me for, you know, and I'm actually just kidding, but you have to say it. So anyways, that being said, we are going to talk about some, some subjects tonight with our guest and he is going to be coming on and he's going to tell some stories and I'm going to tell some stories and we're going to go back and forth and hopefully we'll entertain you. And right now we're going to introduce our guest. This is Nathan Samora. Okay. So Nathan, you are from. I'm originally from Southern Colorado. Um, a little valley, San Luis Valley. It's actually quite popular with the paranormal, but nothing really to write home about. You know, not a lot of stuff down there. Not, not nothing to write home about. So, if someone were to go there and get attacked by a skinwalker, they don't. It's not something to write home about. You, you know, <laughs> I haven't come across any skinwalkers myself, so you know, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> I'm just playing. There's a lot of crazy stuff down there. Uh, yeah, but it's it's a beautiful place. So and and so this this area, how far is that from Denver, where you're at? It's about a four hour uh, drive south of Denver. Oh, that's a good so, hike. So you're a pretty good yeah, ways it's, down. It's uh, right off the uh, New Mexico and Colorado border, kind of central to uh, Colorado. So let me ask you one more question: How close is it to the Royal Gorge? Um. It's probably about a two hour drive. That's not bad. That's not bad so to go and to fall into the earth. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pretty I, much. I say that because when I know in Colorado, it's it's a, a different area that that Durango and where you're at and and all that. That's a whole different. It, it's almost like a different terrain, but still very beautiful in its own right. It has it's a different Absolutely. yeah different type of mountains or whatever. I went to the Royal Gorge, folks, when I was a kid, and I looked at pictures of it the other day. And I was like, holy crap. I was always on top of that thing. And it was so far up. It's so deep. And it's much scarier than the Grand Canyon because it's steeper. Like the Grand Canyon, we were at the Grand Canyon last summer or whatever. And it was like, you know, I mean, it, it kind of, you fall, you'll hit like a ledge and another ledge and then another ledge. It's like, you know, there's all, there's like, it's like stepped out. Like there's steps. But like the Royal Gorge is just like very steep in a lot of places. So it's it's a very uh, intimidating. I can't believe that they made made a, a bridge that people could drive across, and it still looks very unsafe. Like I would not want to drive across that and just hope that <laughs> some engineers got it right. Yeah, it's high up. There's nothing uh, <sighs> stopping your fall if you fall off that bridge. No, I mean in the middle of it is it's just it's almost like a suspension. You know, it's just it is. I mean, it's like a it's isn't it like the the the. I know it's the largest suspension bridge in in North America. I don't know if it is in the entire world, but it's it's pretty crazy looking. So I was thinking the other day, I was like, man, I'd like to take a trip to Colorado for a while and get away from everything. And then, then you look at the Royal Gorge and there's like all these cars on it. And you're like, golly, man, I ended up falling in. But uh, I just thought about that because we had talked the other day and I went and looked it up, you know, Colorado. 
and I didn't exactly know, you know, how close you were. So thanks for clearing that up for me. And so when I'm in Colorado, we can maybe go to the Royal Gorge because I'd like to go back. So I have a question for you, Nathan. You, you had some experiences, but they weren't all in Colorado. Now you had some experiences in different places, right? I have. Most of them have been in Colorado. One of the stories I'll talk about um, actually occurred out in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Okay. And Fort Sill, for those of you who don't know, a lot of people do boot camp there in the army, right? Right. Right. It's a big field yeah. artillery base. Yeah. And, and some people do boot camp at Benning, Fort Benning. That's where the jump school is. But you went to Fort Sill. Were you artillery? I was still artillery, 13 Bravo. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it, was, it was a lot of fun. Well, yeah, artillery Artillery seems like fun. At least you don't have to be on the front lines. You can be in the back shelling the heck out of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, writing messages on the rounds and throwing them down range, it's, it's not too bad. So, so, one of, so one of your experiences happened there, but what we're going to do, we're going to start with the very beginning. The first paranormal experience you had when you were, uh, I think you were 17 years old? Yeah, I was about 16, 17. I don't remember exactly how old, but. But um, that that's probably when I first had my legit paranormal experience. Okay, and do you do you want to start with that one? Yeah, absolutely. So, I uh, I started getting interested in the Ouija board. I think when I was a young kid, you know, listening to my parents' stories. You know, they'd have friends over and they'd get to drinking, they'd get to talking about their stories. And uh, ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by them. Didn't really want to experience anything myself. Um, but as I got older. You know, I started messing around with the Ouija board. Don't do not do the Ouija board at home or anywhere else, folks. And uh, I started playing the Ouija board by myself. And that's something you should never do. It, it's super risky. And I was young. And, you know, I thought nothing could happen to me. Basically, and playing the Ouija board by myself, I started to actually hear voices. Now, I've never heard voices before. I've never heard voices after. But during a small period of time, um, I'd hear, like, I'd be sitting at the the uh, dining room table and I'd hear this voice inside my head clear as day say someone's at the door and it was always in a female voice you know and I I don't know what that means but uh, you know as soon as I would hear the voice I'd hear knocking at my door or um, I'd hear the same voice say someone's getting ready to call you and then the phone would ring it was really weird it wasn't too malevolent you know at that age I thought it was cool I was like yeah you know I kind of got superpowers over here um, but it didn't last long. One night I was by myself. My parents uh, drove to the town over, you know, we had to drive uh, to Walmart, which was about a 30 minute drive away from the town I grew up in. That's how small of an area this is. And I was watching the craft in the front room and I heard this loud bang and, um, coming from my room. So I rushed into my room. I was the only one in my house. And, um, there was one of my dresser drawers was all the way out. And up on its side. And normally, I couldn't even take that drawer out because I had a desk in a way. So you couldn't fully pull it out. Um, but somehow it managed to find its way completely dislodged from my dresser. And it was staying straight up. And all of its contents was all over my room. And in this, in the dead center of my room was my Bible standing straight up, upside down. And uh, that just that gave me the creeps. And um, that's when I swore off the uh, Ouija board. I'm like, you know what? Voice is one thing. It's kind of cool, but now I'm just, all this weird stuff is starting to happen, you know. Um, and uh, so I, that night, I took my Ouija board and I burned it. And I didn't hear a scream or anything like you hear some people say. It was just this cardboard round Ouija board that I bought online. And um, ever since I got rid of that thing, the voices stopped. I didn't have any other paranormal experiences there for a while until. Later on down the line, I decided to mess with that Ouija board again, and then I had my next experience. Okay, so you're a very hard-headed individual. I learned that from (laughs) from you. you, 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 The the Ouija board didn't kill you the first time. It just threw the Bible around and did some bad stuff. But you know, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, So you didn't learn. (laughs) You like those guys that play on the golf course, and there's an alligator on the third hole. Just play through. You know, no biggie. If he bites your leg and takes you into the water, you know, just keep going. Oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So fast. So, so the next experience you had was actually at Fort Sill. 
in Oklahoma, right? It was. It was a couple years later. Um, I was going to AIT at Fort Sill. That's where we learn our uh, our MOS or our military uh, specialty. And um, it was it was early on. We were still in reception. Uh, when you're in reception, you're you're in one part of the base for a couple weeks while they're doing all the in processing, and then they move you somewhere else for your training. And um, it was later on the e- in the evening, so everything we had to do for the day was done, and we should have been shining our boots or cleaning and other stuff, but. I gathered a couple of friends of mine and uh, being the instigator I am, I came up with a bright idea like, Hey guys, we should play the Ouija board. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? We don't have a Ouija board. So yeah, we improvised and we made one out of cardboard, you know, with cardboard and Sharpie. We made a planchet out of cardboard and, um, you know, we weren't sure if it was going to work, but we figured why not? You know, there's nothing else to do. That was exciting at least. And so, the way this reception area was laid out, there were all these big buildings, barracks, we call them. And there was one building in particular that I never saw anyone use the whole two weeks, two weeks they were there. It was pretty much vacant, you know, and we decided to take this homemade Ouija board and take it to this empty building because we didn't want to get caught by the drill sergeants. That would have been uh, no good at all. And uh, we hid in the uh, janitor's closet inside this bay or inside these barracks. And the layout inside the barracks, you know, it's this long hallway. There's bunks, roughly about 60 bunks, all lined up along the sides, both sides, and uh, wall lockers in between the bunks, two sets of wall lockers. And so we were in the janitor's closet with our flashlights, and we started playing the Ouija board, you know, asking the typical questions. You know, is anyone here? How did you die? You know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, one of my friends was like, no, this isn't, this isn't real. You know, you guys are moving the plant shit, that kind of stuff. And they started antagonizing this quote unquote spirit that we were communicating with. And, um, the plant shit, it started doing slow at first, slow sideways figure eights or like infinity symbols on the board. And they're real small at first. And the speed started picking up and the figure eights started getting bigger and bigger. Until it, it got so fast that the plant should actually flew out from under our hands, under our fingertips. It flew off the board. And uh, that was a little freaky. But then we heard this loud bang from inside the barracks. Keep in mind, we had the janitor's closet shut because we didn't want to get caught. And um, we heard this loud bang. And we jumped up. We initially thought it was a drill sergeant or someone else that was going to catch us, you know, hiding and doing this stuff. And um, we opened the door. And that's when we heard this deafening, loud drone noise. Um, what it was, was um, the actual bunks. All 60 of the bunks in that bay were uh, were bouncing up and down violently, super fast. You could actually see the, the little, uh, the foot of the bunks lifting about three to four inches off the floor and then slamming down. Um, the wall lockers in between the bunks, the doors were actually opening and then slamming shut. And uh, everything was done so rapidly, and the sound was just deafening. And, of course, it, it scared the living daylights out of us. You know, we, we got up. I didn't, We didn't care if we got caught at that point. We just hauled out of that building. As we were running, it could have been my imagination, but it seemed like the noise was getting louder and louder, like right at our heels as we were running out of there. It did not want us in there. I don't know if my friend just got on its last nerve or what. But um, it, it was probably the most intense experience I've ever had in my life. Um, as soon as we got free of that building, closed the door, all the banging, all the noise, it just suddenly stopped, and it was as quiet as could be. Um, so we, of course, you know, threw away the Ouija board, and, and we went back and continued on with our training and, you know, tried to stay on the straight and narrow for the rest of that, that time frame. Um, but that, that, that experience was, it was something else, man. It was, it was pretty, uh, frightening. What made you want to, what made you want to play with the Ouija board again after the first experience? You know, the first experience wasn't too scary. I mean, it, it would, it was a little startling. And, uh, you know, there were some big warning signs like, Hey, don't touch it. You know, don't touch this thing. You mm-hmm. know, and so if you're like flipping the Bible upside down in your room, but, but we were just young. You know, thinking we were invincible, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old, you know, and, uh, and we were just bored. And, uh, you know, I, I think my friends and I just kind of fed off of each other and worked ourselves up to, to you know, playing with the board. Wasn't wasn't the brightest thing I've done. 
But it was your idea, though, right? It, it was my idea. I, <laughs> oh, I'll my admit. <laughs> wow. So that day, Nathan got up and put on bad idea jeans. While all that was happening in the barracks, the, the bed moving and the stuff happening, did you guys happen to see anything or just it was just stuff moving around by itself? You know, we jumped up and we ran out of there so fast. Um, I know I didn't look around. I just, I wanted to get out of there. So there could have been something in there. I don't think any of us noticed anything. Um, we did see the bunks moving and the wall lockers slam- opening and slamming shut. Um, but those were the only things I saw. You know, I just, I just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. Nobody ever said that something grabbed them or anything like that? No, no. It just, we all pretty much shared our experiences and it was just pretty much uh, verbatim, you know, what everyone else perceived. You know, mm-hmm. we just, you know, our only thought was getting out of there. We did not want to be there, of course. So, yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like a good time. Um, so, nothing happened after that. No, after that, and you know, whenever I played with the Ouija board, I'd always get this weird feeling, like you know, I'd overthink and and ask myself, I wonder if something followed me, because you always hear those stories. But no, nothing else after that experience. It, it was years since you know until you I tell. had anything yeah. else, and well, of what course is- I was with the Ouija board as well. <laughs> yeah. I heard a rumor about uh, Ouija boards. The only way to get rid of them is to give them to somebody else. But I heard that a long time ago when I was real little. <clears throat> well, actually, for years I did that. I would I would open up portals with them and then just go give them away as Christmas presents. <laughs> I'd put them back in the box, wrap them up, and here you go. Anthony actually get one from me and. Yeah, kind of changed his life. Uh, so, anyways, I, what happened with you though, Nathan? You 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 played with one the first time, and then you played with one again at, at, at basic training. But did anything happen like in between the time of the first one and the second one? You know, I can't think. I can't remember. It was it was decades ago. You know, now I'm now I'm aging myself, but it was a long time ago. I. Those were the only two events that really stood out in my memory. Um, I had one small occurrence where we were messing around um, in a cemetery. You know, I was young and dumb. Again, the windshield cracked on us, but that that was pretty much it. And of course, Ooh. we were playing the Ouija board. And, you know, Jeez. but I didn't I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. The windshield just cracked, maybe four inches. <laughs> you know, nothing major, but nothing major. Outside of that, <laughs> you know. In the San Luis Valley, uh, Southern Colorado, um, it gets extremely cold. It's one of the coldest places in the country. So that's what I told myself. I was like, there's nothing crazy going on here. It's just, it happens. But, uh, the timing was coincidental for sure. Yeah. Cause if you're, I mean, that's <laughs> okay. So you were, you were in a cemetery and you were playing with a Ouija board. This was the, so this was really the second time that in the cemetery, that, that was the second time. But, you know, I I can't really say that it was paranormal or not. You know, it could have been just a coincidence, but, you know, that that's really the only other thing that comes to memory. I, I don't think anything followed me. You know, you hear that happening sometimes. And, no, it's just mainly when I was messing with that board, did Jeez. anything happen? So some people tempt evil, and you're over there, like, tempt fate or whatever you want to call it, and you're over there, like, like begging it, taunting <laughs> it. You're like, come on, fate, you nothing but a little... And then, <laughs> and, and fate something just, like that. Yeah, and so you decided to like just throw some. You just like peed at it, dude. Like seriously, <laughs> you're just like, oh my gosh. Okay, because I can tell you. Okay, let me tell you a quick story. Now that's interesting that you were talking about the windshield cracking. I've had a, like like a, on my show. Anybody that listened to my show and have heard me talk, I've had a lot of very weird paranormal experiences. I was walking through a mall one time with a buddy of mine named Jerome, and he's actually on my Facebook, and you can you can message him and, and, and harass him. I don't know if he'll respond, but we were walking through the mall here in Austin at Barton Creek. This really happened. Just just like most, like I was telling you the other day, honey, most of my paranormal experiences, like I've had other people with me that could literally verify that. And she was like, you know, that's unique in the way that there's a few things that have happened to you when you were on your own, but most of it, you had witnesses. And here, this was one of them. We were, there was this girl that Jerome was dating and she worked at the gap and 
unbeknownst to myself, because I don't do these kind of things. I'm not a horrible person. I don't like you guys. I don't play with magic and stuff like that. I'm a good guy. I don't do those things. So I was walking along with this guy and we walk as we were walking up to the gap, we had gone to get one of those, uh, I think they were like those pretzel things with the hot dog in them or whatever you call them. And the ones that you pretzels. Yeah. I never, I never ate those until Nelly introduced them to me. And then I was like, holy crap. And then they're just loaded with sodium. So I can't eat them. But we were walking up and Jerome saw her talking to some other guy and he really liked his girl and he was never one to be really like, not really care, but he was like, said something in German kind of like angrily because he could, he could visibly tell she was like flirting with this dude. And he said something and the, the glass, the right out, like, like, you know how the glass on the outside, like you can see in, you know, th- into the store with all the, you know, it cracked like right in front of us. It just went like, and it, and it like went across, like, you know, you like as from my vantage point, it went through them. Like you could see it and he was all like, whoa. And then like later on we were driving home and and our our friend uh, Taz, Willie Taz was with us, but he was, he was kind of behind us and not really looking up. He didn't see it crack. He walked, he heard it and he he looked at it. When we were driving back to the house after he talked to her or whatever, because that guy, I guess is somebody that she had been from, from what I understood, like had been talking to before, and so he was, he was angry, but uh, apparently according to what he had told, uh, my other friend, he had been playing with a Ouija board like a couple days before that. And so some weird stuff had happened. I remember Jerome was always like messing with stuff like that. He always had books about hypnotism and trying to hypnotize girls into loving you and so falling in love. <laughs> he was he was a ladies man but he was always like trying to find a way to get a leg up on the competition if so yeah, you gotta tell me josh did it work um i don't think he got any more like he didn't like he wasn't as uh you know i mean he didn't do any better than i did and i didn't use hypnotism you know whatever i just told a bunch of crap i just lied that's how i got <laughs> nelly i was like i'm very rich i'm powerful you love so me dumb. i'm just playing honey <laughs> She knows better than that. But yeah, the, the, he, he would do that. He would like, he had these like books about like when he was, when he was moving out one of the three or four times that he moved out and then came back because he went to go live with somebody and it didn't work out. So one of the times he was moving, he had all these books, you know, like this magic, you know, and how to, how to inc- increase your charisma and all this other stuff. But I just remember like walking up and that glass cracking and you know what? In fact, I, th- I think my brother might have been with me too, but it was like me and him in the front. And I think Willie and, and, and my brother were kind of behind us. In fact, I'm pretty sure my brother was with us. But that just reminds me when you said the cracked glass, like I saw that happen too. I like, I literally like witnessed that happening. And now when we were talking about it, um, you know, when me and you were talking before the show, you didn't tell me about the cracked glass thing. So that, that's me just hearing that right now. And I've never really had a, any pertinent reason to, to talk about that but that's, <laughs> that's that's one of the the weird things that happened i think there was another thing that happened to him in this house that he was staying at like uh when he had when he had moved out at one point he had moved into this house in east austin and like he saw something weird in that house like a shadowy looking thing or something but i i think i think it had something to do with his um uh, messing around with that ouija board you're you're fortunate if if nothing really happened. You said that nothing happened either when after what y'all did at Fort Sill, there wasn't any there wasn't any more interaction, like nothing happened on the barracks, no more nothing paranormal that couldn't be explained. I'll leave that that. Okay. Well that's fortunate for you because typically, you know, when when you play with the Ouija board a whole lot and you have some stuff like that happen that's indicative of a very powerful uh, entity that can do, it can manipulate things. If they can make bunks in an entire barracks bounce up and down and there's no telling what it could have done. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, those barracks, they're, they're really long. They're, they're huge rooms. And I mean, it just, it's a lot of energy to do something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now you also said something about an ex-girlfriend that had played with a Ouija board. Yeah, so this was um this was years after um after I got out of the military. My my ex girlfriend, she lived in a she lived in a small little house out in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. 
you know, that house was, was somewhat haunted. You know, um, every once in a while they would see little shadows or they would hear things or here's something I didn't tell you is really weird. You know, I, I'm really into crystals. I had this uh, crystal and um, it was just a quartz crystal pendant. And um, I was laying down talking to her. The, the crystal, I was messing with in my hand. And then when we were done talking, I sat up and I noticed the crystal was missing. You know, so it fell out of my pendant. That's what I thought. So I was looking all over the bed. I was looking all over, you know, the surrounding area. I couldn't find it. I ended up finding the crystal in the kitchen, which was clear on the other side of the house about 10 minutes later. And it was stuffed in the corner behind the trash can. So, but weird stuff like that would happen all the time. Stuff would get missing and we would just blame it on the ghost. We named him Harry, Harry the ghost. And I don't know where that name came from. Harry and the Hendersons. (laughs) Something. (laughs) So, but, uh, um, so your your crystals, you just you used them for positive energy, or were you using them to communicate with something? No, I did. I I use them pretty much for positive energy. You know, just you know for the vibes that they give, or it, it just I like. I've always been fascinated with crystals anyway. I they do didn't have metaphysical properties, but you know I've never really noticed anything profound in my life that has changed because of them but you know, i did care i did wear them and i i have a bunch of crystals for that reason you know it, it hasn't hurt right you know I've, I've been kind of a spiritual person my whole life i'm a christian but i'm also pretty spiritual i do a lot of meditation stuff like that so yeah mm-hmm. it, it took the crystal out of the pendant and, and you know hit it out in the corner in a, a totally different room what do you think about the um now i might be saying this wrong but i think it's called oregon the little pyramids I've seen those. I've never really uh, put too much thought into them. You know, I, I just, I like crystals, you know, just because they're raw. I mean, mm-hmm. they could be tumbled or, or um, you know, cut to look a certain way. But uh, I haven't really, uh, I know what you're talking about, but I, I don't know too much about them. Oh, okay. Well, haven't you had some, some, didn't it help you, Nelly, or something with your pain? Yeah, I, I have one. And I am, um, it's a, for me, I've experienced it calming me because I get a little anxious and um, I just like put it close to me or, and it feels, I feel like it, it helps calm me down. Yeah, I guess I could see that. I did have, um, there for a while, I carry the Moldavite crystal, um, which is a crystal that, that is formed by uh, an asteroid or meteor falling from the sky. It hits the ground and then it kind of uh, interacts with the sand and then creates almost like a glass. And those mm. are called tech types. And so I had this Moldavite, which is supposedly a really powerful crystal. And uh, during that time, they're supposed to bring forth transformation, needed transformation. And uh, long story short, <laughs> I, I ended up getting a divorce during the time that I was carrying that Moldavite. So so there could be some truth to them. You know, I, mm. I don't know. But, was, um, was the divorce a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and... and in the moment, it was bad, but in retrospect, um, you know, it was a good thing. Some good things came from it. So, well, there you go. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so so in that house, it was haunted, and um, you know, I got the bright idea to um, to buy a Ouija board from the local Toys R Us, and uh, I ended up talking her. She didn't want to, but you know, me being the honorary person I am, I ended up talking her into trying it. You know, because I'm like, this is perfect, haunted house. Like, let, let's talk to Harry. Let's see what he has to say, you know? And um, so we started playing the Ouija board, and um, we never got a hold of Harry. Uh, we talked to a couple spirits, and you never know. I mean, it could be the same thing. It could be your imagination or subconscious. It's, it's hard to say. But in this particular situation, um, when we stopped playing the Ouija board, you know, and nothing crazy or paranormal, ha- paranormal happened when we were playing, but the haunting got a lot worse. It became a lot more malevolent and more oppressive. And um, about a week after we played, you know, I woke up about three o'clock in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the night, from this really horrible nightmare. And uh, I, I had this dream that these weird creatures, um, small little like golem-like creatures, were like beckoning me toward like a tunnel. At the end of the tunnel was this big shadowy figure. And that, that's, you know, and I didn't tell you what was in my dream, but I, I thought it was important to share because at the same time, I uh, I was going to message my ex-girlfriend saying, hey, you, I just had this crazy dream. But she ended up calling me 
um, before I got a chance to message her, and she told me, Nathan, you know, you never believe what happened. I had this horrible nightmare. Um, and then I woke up and I saw this shadowy figure standing over me. Her four year old son was uh, sleeping with her at the time in her house. And, uh, he saw the same thing. He, you know, he was just like, mommy, mommy, who's that man standing looking at you? But, um, yeah, she, she experienced a nightmare at the same time and saw the same, I, what I believe is the same shadowy figure uh, that I saw in my dream, but she saw it when she woke up, it was standing over it. And then it just, it just disappeared. She said, <clears throat> so that, that gave me the creeps and I felt a lot of guilt because I felt like it was my fault that things were getting as bad as they were getting at her house. Um, I ended up getting some sage and, and, uh, we ended up cleansing her house. I got some black onyx crystal rocks and, uh, hung them in the corners of her room where she slept because they're supposed to be real good for grounding like negative energy and that type of stuff. And then we saged and we were saying Lord's prayer, went through each house and I had the owner of the house, you know, forcefully saying, you're not welcome here. You must leave. And, you know, like everything I saw on like paranormal ghost shows, <laughs> I'm by no <laughs> means an expert in that kind of stuff, but it, it really worked. It, it you know, it, it really toned it down and it was almost at the level where it was before uh, we ended up playing with the board in the first place. Wow. So you really caused some problems. <laughs> Jeez. I did. My, and my old house was haunted, you know, and we never, ever did anything like that, like play with a Ouija board or mess with anything like that. Um, I did use sage on more than one occasion. I actually um, made some rosemary chicken and I used sage and cilantro <laughs> and some dill. And it was, it was tasty. It was tasty. It didn't totally agree with me. And I blamed it on the house. I was like, thanks a lot. Demon ghost things. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's mad that you're using sage. <laughs> like, we're gonna mess with this food. I'll tell you what though. The oregano is really good on it though. I really like that one in particular. No, I was, I was at the grocery store the other day and I actually saw sage on there. And I thought if, and, and this is just silly, but I, I mean, I really, this thought really crossed my mind. I was like, it sprouts or something. And I was like, I wonder if you eat sage. If it could get rid of anything like demonic in your body, because <laughs> sage is supposedly if you burn it, you know it does. I just the thought just crossed my mind, and I was like, "No, nah. well, that's a thought. Maybe on something. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. I mean, it's just a weird thought. You know, t touching also on what you just said about the little the demonic little uh, golem looking dudes that with the uh, shadow guy. Mm, yeah. I got I got something that parallels that. Uh, there was a lady in California, and a buddy of mine did a lot of, uh, he was doing like transcendental meditation and he was doing all this like cleansing, helping people get rid of stuff, whatever. He actually did a, and it's weird that we were talking about because he actually went out to California and did a cleansing for a lady out in San Jose. And there was a haunting that was going on and it was like that. There were these little uh, demonic, like duende little monitos or whatever you want to call them, like in Spanish you would say. And they were basically like hurt, like hurting her and her children. They would like throw things when they were asleep. They could see them like in their dreams. Okay. So, which tells me it probably wasn't really a dream. They could see these things and they would run around the room. The kids would say that they would throw their toys at them and this and that. But, but it, when it was in their waking hours, they could, they would just have this poltergeist like activity going on. Like they would go into the kitchen and like a uh, can opener got thrown at somebody, went straight toward their head. And so I don't know what that, what that was. I mean, as far as like, other than the, to explain that it's probably those little, you know, those little imps or whatever they were that were doing it. But there was something else there too. There was like this larger entity that was this huge black mass, like shadowy thing that started to manifest and here's the kicker. When, when, when my friend questioned them, he doesn't do this anymore because he had a bad experience when he was out in Vermont and he was like, I'm done. But this, this, this was a very powerful haunting too. And when he questioned them about their, um, what they might've done, who they could, you know, everybody was mum like, Oh no, I, I didn't do anything. I don't know anything. Well, eventually a teenage girl that was friends of, of, uh, the teenage daughter's friend, she was like 14 and her friend was, she was 13. They had played with a Ouija board and they had, but they had played with it outside on the patio. And so the little girl was like, well, 
I did play with a Ouija board. She didn't want to tell her mom, I guess, because she felt responsible because it happened the night after they played with it. And she said, but we played with it outside. And the, the guy, my friend, uh, um, I don't say his name because I didn't, you know, we're, we're not really, we're friends. We're not like buddies or anything, but I've, I've met the guy through Facebook or whatever. But he was saying that he, when he questioned, he pressed for answers, you know, and the, the, the girl, they didn't want to admit it. He could tell she kept looking away. So he took her to the side and he said, look, you know, if you did this, we're going to have to sacrifice you to get rid of the demon. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, your blood for, you know, blood for blood. Sorry, lady. That's how it goes. Um, they're going to take you and take you to a fiery pit of torment and everyone else is going to be fine. This is the price you got to pay. Viking rules. Uh, you know, hate the game. Not you the player. me. <laughs> <laughs> you know hate the game not the player so oh you know, he just had to lay it out there for her so what ended up happening though for, on, on the serious side what ended up happening like he he told her you know well we got to pray you know they did the lord's prayer they did all these things like you said basically you know an episode of ghost hunters of, of take your pick of what ghost show and they they did the sage and all this other stuff that he does and he was just i was just reading he was telling me about it and um yeah it was pretty crazy i was going to tell that story concerning ouija board because i was going to do another ouija board story but i have so many like it's it's unreal like how many ouija board stories yes it's unreal how many people play with these things <sighs> nathan <laughs> that is no you got me yeah i mean it, i don't, mean don't play with them That's yeah exactly i, I mean the, I the moral <laughs> to the story is that, that you know the the shadow entity continued to kind of like come and go but the smaller little uh dudes the little imp dudes or whatever they they stop throwing things in the poltergeist activity so to me if i had to, to to say what i thought was going on there i would say those kids play with the ouija board they opened something up the imps came through they were like the the little uh henchmen of the big guy the evil the shadow guy and um I think the imp things lost their power a little bit, you know, through the, the efforts of the praying and all that other stuff. But the bigger, stronger entity continued to have a, a, a very strong hold. And eventually uh, they did move from that house and they actually ended up moving to another city. In fact, another state. So where they ended up moving to, they, as far as I know, I asked the guy and he said that he, he lost touch with them several months after they moved. But from what he was told everything was fine. So maybe the people that moved in afterwards. You know, and so that brings up another point. Uh, Nellie, <clears throat> one of the reasons why you are my co-host tonight, because uh, I couldn't tell you it was about Ouija boards because it scares you. So I had to get you on here. But you had, when you first saw your the, the dog man creature come into your room as a child you you guys had found a planchette that somebody had obviously played with yeah i found it yeah. um my, my my sister didn't even know it was there so somebody somebody was messing with a ouija board in that house yeah and so the evil entity appeared in the in the shape of a wolf, werewolf type creature a cat a dog a, man. an upright canid dog man if you will because somebody before, very Nathan esque, had played with a Ouija board, who caused in my room. Thank you for causing my <laughs> wife pain, Nathan. Indirectly, I'm going to just blame it on Nathan type people. Oh, From now on, so all now Ouija board players tonight. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Ouija board players will be be known as Nathanites. <laughs> in, the, in the paranormal roundtable community, folks, oh my. remember that. Oh, you're one of those Nathanites. You op open portals to for the devil. Oh, thank you. That's great. So, yeah, and so, so, so I think that 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 you know experience what what happened when 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 you mess with those things, you know, it opens up something. It, it does something, and it creates a havoc. Um, I believe it because there was a lot a lot more uh, paranormal activity in that room and um, more so than other parts of the house, but it was a lot of it was in my room specifically. So yeah, I, that's what made me think that they, they must've played with it, played with the, the, with the Ouija so board in my room. Zero. Yeah, I think so. Wow. Well, that's what it sounds like. You know, I, I really do think the Ouija board, um, it's an occult tool and um, you know, there's other things that can do it, but 
I really do think it opens portals, or if anything, it thins that veil, making you a lot more susceptible to to things on the other side. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's you know, I I have family. My father has some horrible experiences with the Ouija board, and you know, some things follow him. And it's just it's something. It's not a toy, guys. It's it's really not. And I got off super lucky, but I know some people who haven't. You know, and it's just, it's not worth it. it. It does open that portal. Yeah, I've heard of people getting violently ill, like very ill from playing with the board, the Ouija boards. Yeah, I think it perforates uh, or, or, or punctures the veil. And in fact, it just kind of, you know, and, and it opens holes, portals. One of the things I know, Nathan, you had talked about, you were our follower of Dogman Encounters. <clears throat> and we were talking about, Dogman encounter, like when we, because you said you you had heard me on that show, and a lot of people who follow my work have been following me since I was on that show many times. And one of the things that the host Vic had talked to me about was a lot of times people who see these dogman creatures have messed with Ouija boards. I don't know if Vic uh, Vic didn't tell me not to say anything about it, so I'm going to say it. But (laughs) he he didn't say don't say anything about this, but. That that is, I really believe that that is par- part and parcel of what what's going on with this whole phenomena. I think that I have a story I'll tell, and and it's it's not a real long drawn out story. And then we'll get to uh, some more of your you know things that went on with you. There was a couple. This happened in Florida, and I believe Pensacola, and they were messing around with the Ouija board. It was a middle aged couple. Um, they were like, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're early fifties or something like that. And their last, uh, child like that, that had gone away to college or whatever. And they were like, woohoo, time for the freaking wild parties, man. So they started <laughs> doing, doing the marijuana and playing with the Ouija board. And <laughs> so, oh, not the marijuana. <laughs> they did one marijuana's and the whole house burned down. It was terrible. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> the way to go, way to go. Now, <laughs> if they're li- if you're listening, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to. I'm not making light of what happened to you guys at all. I'm, I'm very. I'm seriously not. I'm just a goofball. <laughs> so <laughs> what ended up happening? Um, like I said, you know, they, they had gotten married young and they had children and their last chi- uh, child, they had three kids and the last one had gone away. She'd gone away to college. And so they were just kind of having nights where they would have another couple come over and hang out and they, they just do what, you know, people that age would do it. And just, you know, the, sometimes they'd hang out by the pool and they, they, they'd play dominoes and whatever. And it wasn't anything like, you know, and so the 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 woman told me she said we're, his life was getting kind of boring. You know, it wasn't really we weren't really doing much. You know, we retired. We, my husband was on the verge of retirement, and so every weekend we were just kind of taking it easy. Uh, she had already retired, I believe, as a school teacher, and so one of her friends, uh, that whose name was Anne. That's I'll say that because I don't know this person, but I'm not going to say the, the other lady's name. But her friend Anne came over. And brought a Ouija board. And she's like, hey, let's play. So they did. And they they got in touch with a, a malevolent spirit. Like something came. And she said she knew it was malevolent because one of the first things it said, spelled out on the board, was kill. And she was like, okay. And then it says, then so her friend Ann and the husband, her the, the, the Ann's husband was like, no way, I'm not playing with that. But the lady who uh, that that told me this story, now her husband was like, "Okay, fine, I'll humor it." So he's like, "Kill what?" And the, and it said, "You." And he's like, "You," as in me. And then it said, "Everyone." And it said, "Why?" And it said, "Hate you." And so whatever this thing was, and then it said, "Hate you." Like you know, he he tried to be kind of snide with it, you know. To, he's kind of pushing it, you know, and he says. Well, hey, well, like, give be specific, and it says people. <laughs> so this thing basically said it hates people, and it hates us, and so he pushed it, and he said, "Why?" And he says, "He says world was ours." So what does that mean? Uh, you know, what is he channeling? Um, some sort of ancient Nephilim? Yeah, exactly. Nephilim some sort of thinking. demonic spirit. And so that night, um, nothing happened to them at their house. But her friend Anne got slapped and had scratches on her face and got knocked right out of her bed. 
Now that would sound completely terrifying and crazy, but it turned out to be your husband and he was just like using the excuse to <laughs> smack her. He's like, oh, and I'm just kidding. That's not that That's folks. Not that is not what happened. <laughs> that is not what happened. He's like, okay, and you want to take all the covers? Oh, well, you did play with that during Ouija board, honey. Told you we didn't need that thing. Um, but anyways, no, what happened was she got, she got smacked literally out of the bed and her husband woke up and he saw what he saw was the covers going off the bed on top of her. And she was just laying there in shock and it wasn't him. You know I mean? Like they both were like, so the next day she, she calls and she tells the, the, the person that gave me this story, she says, Hey, something really crazy happened to me. And the lady that, that did the, you know, that I talked to, she was just like, well, sucks to be you, you know, kind of like, you know, good luck with all that. Glad it didn't happen to me. So a couple days go by and she's like, everything's fine. And then she goes into the kitchen. Now get this. She goes into the kitchen and she's making coffee and her and her husband are talking and they're getting ready to go uh, play golf or something like that. You know, they were like, had a, at a, at a date with another couple to play some golf, whatever. And she's like, we're all getting ready to leave. And I was getting some coffee to put in our thermoses and the coffee pot just pops. Boom explodes and burns her and, gla- and glass goes everywhere and, it, and some of it hit her dog and so the dog got a little piece of glass in its eye like in the corner of its eye but it didn't it didn't affect its vision but they had to take it to the vet and then the whole day was spent dealing with that and then from there it just kind of escalated uh they had some a couple of other couples come over to like a couple weeks down the road uh, a lot of little things that happened, like they heard the toilet flush, you know, they heard water turning on and off in the showers. Um, she saw like one of the more terrifying things, a, the shower curtain being pushed while she was uh, showering. Yeah, it was scary. And then the dog ended up um, just dying. Like they just couldn't, it didn't figure it out. One, one of their dogs just just died. Um, it was pretty sad. And so she contributed it to that because she was like, nothing was going on until that happened. While this was going on, her friend Anne was having all kinds of weird stuff happen. She ended up having a uh, heart palpitation. She was diagnosed with these heart palpitations, ended up having to go to the ho- in and out of the hospital. Her blood pressure was going uh, crazy. She was having all kinds of uh, problems. And then her husband started having seizures who had never had a history of epilepsy, anything like that. So, so this other couple that they had played with this Ouija board with were having all these issues too. And then I think what ultimately ended up happening, <clears throat> her and her husband, um, the, 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 the couple that, that had, that lived in the house with the pool or whatever that, that had the dog died, they ended up in a, in a wreck and it ended up like injuring her husband's back. And so she, they were convinced, I mean, that something was going on with the, with this. It's because of the Ouija board. You know, we played with it. We shouldn't have messed with it. And so they ended up calling someone to come and do like, you know, like we talked about a cleanse or whatever. And they, they, when the lady came into the house, she was like, you're going to need a bigger, a bigger boat because this <laughs> obviously is something You've conjured up something really malevolent, and and she, she told them it was a, a man and a woman that came, you know, and they they told them they're like you're going to need something a lot more powerful than what we can do for you. I mean, you're going to need to bring in, you know, like uh, pretty much a, a, an exorcist, you know this this entity, or whatever you've it, you. She's like, did you antagonize it? You know, because it, it felt like it was angry and it was very powerful and it was malevolent. And they, she says, well. I didn't, you know, but, you know, my husband kind of said some things and, you know, did some things or whatever. Um, the husband did see an entity in the mirror, like when he was like combing his hair, getting ready to go do something and he saw something standing behind him. And so he said it was like black, a, a black entity or whatever. And there was like these red spots where there should have been the eyes. So it was pretty, pretty terrifying. <clears throat> and, you know, of course, whatever it was was strong enough to, you know, unless it was just a coincidence, their dog, you know, take the kill their dog. And the other dog was, was getting sick. And so they tried moving like they moved from that particular house. Now, uh, by moving, it did seem to lessen like the, the activity. But it started to mess around with them uh, at the other place eventually, and then their daughter got out of college, and like a lot of kids, they go to college and think, I'm going to rule the world, and instead they just go back and live in their mom and dad's house, which is what happened to this particular kid 
So she comes back to go and live with them, and th- this thing starts up anew in the new house, which was in the same town or you know close to it, like on the on the in, in the edge of town, and started to um, like harass and mess with the uh, the daughter. And so the daughter started having a whole new round of dealing of with this shenanigans or whatever, but it didn't get as violent as it did in in the other house. Like it was almost like it lost its head of steam. Um, now her friend Anne did continue to have uh, health problems. She said, "Now this was almost twenty years ago." Um, or, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This was almost uh, f- uh, ten years ago. She said, "Because this is 2000." Yeah, I'm almost okay. So 2010, I believe. Uh, her friend Anne did pass away, and so to, to for the last you know several years of her life, she was dealing with this you know, problem with this entity or whatever, it continued to stalk her and her husband and mo- mostly her, you know, um, didn't really mess with her husband, you know, and, and the, the interesting thing about it was that Anne's husband didn't play with it. The other, the other woman, um, I'm, I would give her some fake name. We'll just call her, um, M. Okay. M M and, and her husband did and her husband in particular like antagonized it. it was like asking like silly questions like oh you think you're tough and this and that um things that you probably should never be asking especially when it starts off with kill you you know and she oh, was no. like she said they, they they had a lot of regrets you know from playing with it um just you know and then of course there was a slew of weird things that i was told and i can't even remember them all but like okay one day she was looking for her house keys or car car keys and she looked everywhere and so she just gave up and she's like she just called her friend and says i can't i'm not going to be able to go play bridge or whatever because i'm i can't find my freaking car keys unless you want to come get me so the friend's like yeah sure i'll come get you so the friend goes well while she's waiting she goes to the freezer to grab an ice cream and uh there's her keys in the freezer. So stuff like that was going on all the time. Another time, uh, like, okay, this is weird. The, the, the husband was like microwaving something, you know, like he microwaved popcorn or something. I think it was popcorn. And he, and he hears the popping, you know, but then he hears, you know, all this noise uh, <clears throat> that sounded like the emperor, you know, shocking Luke or whatever at the Death Star. And he's like, what is that? You know? And uh, so he opens the the, the uh, microwave, and there's like a, a huge uh, like ball of like aluminum foil, like just a humongous ball. Like somebody had rolled up, you know, like thirty sheets of aluminum and just stuck it in there. And he's like, "There's no way." He goes, "I didn't. I would not have seen that. You know, it's a large microwave. But how did I? How would I have not seen that in the corner of the microwave?" So wow. weird things like that that were going on, you know, and like. Um, his son had come 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 home to to stay for a few days or whatever <clears throat> he had been you know up up in canada or something and he'd come home and like he was eating a bowl of ramen and the spoon like just bent itself which is another trick that it would do it would like literally so the spoon was bent wrapped around the lip of the bowl and his son was like okay that's cute and uh you know needless to say he gets accosted at the in the night and you know doesn't want to be there so he got a hotel room. <laughs> so the kids didn't even want to stay in that house. Now, when the uh, when they got into the other house, um, <clears throat> you know, the one child that came back to stay or whatever wasn't really a child anymore. But um, she started having all kinds of stuff, having weird nightmares and stuff of the shadowy type entity. She, she it would it would be like trying to take her through this portal in the hallway, and so eventually, you know, they got more help and tried to get it, you know, whatever. And, uh, as, as of the time, the last time I talked to her now, this, this started, like I said, when she was in her fifties and they're like almost 70 now, I believe. And so they have gone through this whole saga and it all started with that Ouija board. Now I do believe that it's like deep sea fishing. I believe that if you go to catch a Marlin, you don't know if you're going to catch a Marlin or a Mako. You're trying you're going to try and catch a Marlin, but you might catch something else. So you just don't know, but the, the, these people, um, obviously <laughs> they hooked something really bad and really big. And when it started making threats and saying they wanted to kill and all this other stuff, should have taken it very seriously. 
And so that, that could be a lesson to people who mess with these things. The Nathanites of the world uh, need to take it. <laughs> just messing with you. They need to take a lesson and understand that, you know, that like what happened to your ex-girlfriend, what happened to you, what happened to these people can happen to anybody. And now I've talked to people on Facebook and they're like, oh, I've played with Ouija board for years. Nothing's ever happened to me. And so then I was like, really? What's your credit score like? And they're like 540. I'm like, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, I rest my case, you know, but you know, the, it, it's just, you know, anything can happen with these deals. I mean, anything like anything from like, you know, bad credit to your car exploding. You never know what's going to happen. So, you know, I, I love your deep uh, sea fishing uh, explanation or description of it. I mean, cause the reality is none of us really know what's on the other side. None of us really know what's out there or what they're capable of. And, um, uh, yeah, it's a horrible experience, but you know, it's it's true. You're you're rolling the dice every single time you touch that thing. Yep. Yep. And you might you might crap out, you know. I mean, you know, I've never really heard of anyone playing with one and anything really productive happens. It's either nothing really happened or something terrible happens. There's not like it was great. The next day I won the lottery, I bought my dream house, you know. Uh, you know, nothing like that ever happens. It's not ever like so let me ask you this, you, you moving on here, you had now, this was interesting when we were talking, it came up, you know, that you had had a uh, sort of a run in with a, what you think was like a reptilian type creature. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's the only way I could describe it. Um, but yeah, I could definitely share what happened. Um, I was going to college. This was after I got out of the army and, um, you know, I, I've always been, like I said, I've always been really spiritual and, um, I was doing a lot of meditating and um, I fell asleep that night listening to um, some binaural beats. I was trying to like level up, you know, uh, my game with, with uh, spirituality and all that stuff. Explain and to the folks at home what, what that is. Binaural beats? Yeah. They're, um, so they're like a certain frequency, um, one played in your left ear, one played in your right, and they're, they're, they're a little off. Like one frequency but might be one number, and then another frequency might be four frequencies higher. You know, and the idea is to create like um to create an effect inside your mind uh, that causes your brain to go into a different wavelength. Um, they call them like alpha, delta type uh, wavelengths, and so that's the whole point. Is uh, people listen to binaural beats when they meditate or when they're sleeping uh, with the desired effect of helping. I guess, enhance, uh, you know, your meditation or whatever it is that you're doing. And so I was listening to these and I fell asleep and, um, I was having this dream and it was, I felt almost betrayed because in my dream, I saw this really beautiful, not quite human, but female, uh, entity or whatever figure. And she was glowing, brilliant white, and she was smiling, looking down at me, and I felt all warm and fuzzy, and I was like, I, I found my soulmate, you know, <laughs> here she is. And, and, um, but suddenly, like the whole vibe changed, and, um, it, it felt really, uh, I felt like a really ominous, uh, presence. And, uh, I woke up, and, uh, you know, and when I was sleeping, right before I woke up, I had this weird sensation. It was almost, it almost felt like, it almost felt like my life force or my soul was being sucked out of me. Um, and that's, that's when the whole vibe changed. And so that woke me up. At least I believe I was awake. And, um, I opened my eyes and there's this creature standing over me. It was like, it was like kneeling over me on the bed. And it looked like this slender reptilian because it had scales. Um, it didn't have any hair. You know, and it had like a, it did have horns on it, like small little horns, kind of like a horny toad almost. Um, and it had like a lamprey, round circular, like lamprey, lamprey like mouth with all these sharp teeth going in circles around its mouth. And it was using that to like, it wasn't touching me, but it was like inches away from my face. And it was like when I was awake, I still felt it like sucking the life out of me. Um, and I was actually feeling weaker and it had these large round eyes. The eyes weren't black, um, like a gray, um, alien, but they were, um, 
they're almost the same color as its skin. It was like a yellowish green, like a light yellow green color. And its eyes were very similar colored, but they had these long vertical slits. And, um, and I started like trying to push it off me and it started fighting against me and, and it was winning. And, um, you know, the whole time I felt like my life force being sucked out of me and I was thinking, I got to do something about this. You know, it, it really scared, it really scared me, uh, quite a bit. And, um, the way I ended up fighting it off physically was I took my thumbs and I jabbed them into its eyes. I know it sounds a little too much to believe, but unless I was dreaming and I thought I was awake, this is, this is what happened. And, and when I shoved my thumbs in its eyes, it kind of like screeched and it jumped off me and it just flew out of my room, like in a blur. It was so fast. And, um, and that was it. You know, I, I don't think I fell asleep the rest of the night. You know, I stayed up and I started working on some schoolwork. Um, but about a week later, I saw it one other time. Um, I had my computer in the corner of my room and, uh, my dresser was right next to my door and I was working on some schoolwork and I got this weird feeling like something was watching me. And, uh, I turned around and that same slender reptilian like figure, um, uh, was kind of like crouching or kneeling on top of my dresser. And when it saw me, um, when it saw that I noticed it, it jumped down. And it almost looked like it hesitated, like zigzagged a little bit. And then it, it took off in a flash out of my room, um, out of the door, and I never saw it again. Um, I also had the uh, overwhelming feeling that it was feminine in nature. And I don't know why. It just it could have been because of the dream I was initially having, but it really did feel it like it it was feminine. It was, it was seducing you in your dream. That's what it was doing, so it could get close to you. <laughs> it was a succubi or something. Yeah. But I believe you because um, I listen to those those uh, tunes as well, and uh, I didn't have anything that quite terrifying happen to me. But I um when I was listening to it, um, I got this overwhelming sense of fear, and then, like there was uh, another presence in the room, and I, I actually made me physically ill. And so I turned it off, and I thought, okay, well maybe I'm just not feeling good or something. But you know, I turned the lights on, and and then I I went to listen to them again. Like a, a week later, and the same thing happened. So I was just like, "Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to play with this anymore." You know, and I, I don't know if they just put you in a different headspace or how exactly it works, the science behind it. But um, you know, I, I think there's something to them. Oh yeah, definitely. So you guys were into some really freaky stuff. I'm glad I wasn't involved in y'all's cult. Uh, man, <laughs> wow. Woo, Nathan, man, you are into some, some people, you know, they're, they're, they're going to go to hell, but you're practically sprinting there, my friend. I'm just, I'm just joking, Nathan. You're, you, you know, when you have a whole cult of Nathanites following you, you know, it, it's kind of bound to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to start seeing Nathanites. You're going to see billboards. You see billboards with Nathan with the white robe with his hands out. Who is Nathan Samora? Oh, man. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? He's like, you're going to spend it with me talking about Nathan. Hey, I get enough pledges by myself, private island. Uh, I might roll with it. You never know. <laughs> you start your own cult. So, uh, so here, here, and then, and then you're going to have all the, this whole, you know, like this whole cult following or whatever. And Nathan programming, it's just going to be called the Nathan programming channel. <laughs> this is your left. This is your right. You're going to die. So, <laughs> so what, what you could do though, I mean, like, because you, you have, um, a pretty crazy story, like as far as like, you know, all, all these things that have happened to you and it could be a lesson for people like the Ouija board thing, because I honestly feel that, that you encountering that, um, creature by some of the things that you've done in particular with the Ouija board opens that up. I mean, so oh, no doubt. Yeah. I believe so too. Yeah. But, but since then you haven't had anything like nothing's like that's really happened to you. Right. You know, since the whole experience where I had to uh, cleanse my ex-girlfriend's house, uh, I, I stopped touching it. I got rid of it, and um, I didn't give it to anyone. But, um, yeah, I haven't had anything else since. The ex-girlfriend or the Ouija, Ouija board? <laughs> you're like, you're like I, my I ex-girlfriend. I quit Ouija touching board, it. Guys. I didn't mess with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I had an ex girlfriend that was a pretty bad slob too, and I wouldn't wanted to clean her house. But thank goodness. So, so w one of the things you had said to me, you know, when we we had talked, you know, in the last couple of days or whatever, you you said you, your uncle had a skinwalker. 
encounter. He did. And, um, you know, I, I don't know too much about the details because he's, he's really hush hush about it. Um, but I could definitely tell you guys what, what I did here. Um, I remember his initial, well, the first time he told me that he came across what he believed to be a skinwalker is when he was younger, you know, he was, he was a biker. I mean, he was a bad guy. He used to ride with like, um, the banditos, uh, the Australian hell's angels. He's done a lot of crazy stuff. And so I'm sure he brought a lot of juju on himself. Um, but he, I remember telling him, telling me that, um, he saw a wolf the size of a horse running across his front yard. And this was on a Indian reservation out in a, out near Durango, a Native American reservation. And, um, you know, and, and there were so many rumors of skinwalkers and just, you know, dark stuff out in that area. You could almost feel it. Like when you go through that area, there's this, there's this different kind of vibe you pick up. Um, kind of oppressive vibe. Um, uh, but yeah, he, he initially, he saw the skinwalker, uh, running across his front yard. And I, I don't know if it was looking in the window or what it was doing, but he said it was literally the size of a horse. Um, fast forward about 10 years and, um, I get to talking to him. He lives in a different state, so I don't see him too much. And, um, he's telling me about how he had to actually go to a medicine woman. Um, because this whole thing with the skinwalker that he was dealing with got so bad and, um, it picked up because whenever he would go to his car, um, he, I remember he told me that he would smell an overwhelming, uh, scent of wet dog odor. Um, and he couldn't figure it out. He didn't have any dogs. His neighbors didn't have any dogs. Um, uh, but it was lit, it was inside his car, not outside, but he would open his door and he would just get hit with this big wolf of wet dog. Um, some other things have happened with him that made him feel like, like, uh, he had to talk to the medicine woman, but you know, like I said, he was hush hush, you know, and the only thing he told me is Nate, if you, um, if you really want to know what I went through and, and you want to know what I know, you're going to have to go to this medicine woman yourself because I'm not at liberty to really talk about it. You know, and, and I guess that's something that this lady asked him, of him. And I never did. You know, I like, I like to be smart about things. Just, just kidding. Um, obviously with the Ouija board, I'm not. <laughs> but, um, so, so he, he, uh, met this medicine woman and they did all these rituals. He mentioned something about the sun. Um, but I, I don't know any of the specifics, but ever since then, um, after, after seeing this medicine woman, um, he never smelt the odor of wet dog. Um, supposedly he had some kind of curse put on him, um, by someone that he, he wronged. And, um, this, this, uh, skinwalker was just part of that deal, I guess. There was, you know, th speaking of curses, I'm going to throw one out there real quick. Not a curse. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to throw one out there. I'm going to throw one out there real quick. All you Nathanites. <laughs> Let me tell you something, mean Gene. All you Nathanites out there. No, what, what, there, there was a guy who, was a bad guy who dealt drugs and he used to go in and out of our club all the time. And he issued a threat to one of my friends over a girl. And this is true. This is a true story. This guy, he, he, and I don't want to say who the guy is. Cause I don't know how he feels about talking about it. Cause it is kind of a spooky thing. And, uh, he actually worked at our club for a little while. And then we, I fired him because he, we found he was selling drugs and I was like, you're going to give me a cut of that, dude. No, I'm just kidding. I did not. I did not, folks. That was a joke. And so, uh, and, and people say you're always saying I'm joking. Well, here's the, 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 the hard, cold facts, everybody. I have to preface. I, I'm joking because people will go, wow, really? So I have to actually tell people that I'm joking. So that, that, so what happened was he issued a threat and a curse in front of all of us out in front of the club. He told my friend, he goes, I'm going to get you. And my friend had just kind of roughed him up pretty good on the dance floor. He's one of my guys back in the day. I'll, I'll just tell you who it is. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, his name's Chico. Everybody calls him Chico. That's not his real name, but Chico had beat him and Nell, and Nell you know who that is. And so he had, he had got the better of this guy pretty, pretty handily because Chico is a monster and had uh, beat him up pretty bad. And so the guy was like, you know what? I curse you and all this and that. So we don't know exactly for sure, but like him, me and Willie were standing outside in front of the club one night and a couple nights after that, and this girl comes up and she says that she's like, I, I, I like you guys. I think you guys are cool. You're always nice to me and my friends and whatever. 
And I knew this girl, like she, we had, we had helped her out a couple times, you know? And, uh, she was like, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. She's like, but my cousin has gone to, you know, a, a, a witch, you know, and has put a curse on you. And I was like, not, not me, but, but my friend Chico. And she's like, and so anybody who's around you could be affected by it, you know? And so a couple, couple of weeks go by and nothing happened. I, you know, and one day, uh, my buddy squid, he tells Chico, he was like, um, so are you okay? Is anything happened? You don't look cursed. I mean, he goes, I feel fine. You know, everything's working. Everything's in order. I just came from the gym and, you know, and he goes, I almost, uh, slipped up in one of my sets and I thought, Oh, I better get a spotter. Nothing happened. You know, he was making a joke about it. Uh, then, then one of our bartenders comes in and he goes, Hey, you know, that cat that was blabbing about putting a curse on you and all this and that, blah, blah, blah. He's like, he was in a car wreck and he was killed. And we were like, Whoa, really? And he goes, yep. And, and it was a bad one. It was a bad wreck. Like he, you know, and I remember specifically when, when the young lady had come up there to us and said that, that she was going to pray for, 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 for him. And uh, she was going to make sure that that curse didn't work. Like she told him that. And I was standing there and me and Taz were, were and Squid were all there. And, uh, you know, and I don't even think it was a couple weeks. I think it was like maybe a week went by. And sure enough, he died in a, in a car wreck. And a few days after that, it was the weekend. And this young lady came in there with her friend and, and she says, yeah, my cousin died in, in, in an accident because that was the curse that he had placed on your friend. And it, and it boomeranged back and it killed him. Well, I've, I've heard of that happening. Like curses coming back tenfold and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yep. And my friend was aspiring at that time to be a wrestler, which he, you know, he, you know, wanted to be a luchador or whatever. And like, it was kind of silly. Like he wanted to do that, you know, and he, and he did, I think for a while he was doing like the amateur wrestling and then he kind of got into other stuff, but he's a big guy, you know? And so we were always like, oh, okay. And sometimes, you know, before work or whatever, we'd play around with the little masks and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, he was a big dude and he wore his mask one time to Walmart with me. And this one lady, she was real animated and she goes, Oh my gosh. And she recognized his little character. Cause I guess it was on the local circuit. <laughs> and, uh, one of, one of my good friends, Lance Hoyt, like he's, he was in WWE for, for a few, several years and he's been in, he's in new world, new world Japan, you know, but all these guys, they wrestled and, and some of them did MMA. And I was always with guys that were fighters and did stuff like that. Um, but yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. We worked with him for years and years. Uh, my brother and everybody else, but, it was weird, you know, because like, I didn't know what to say. Like he was our door guy for a long time. And I went up to him and I said, D did you know this? Like, and I told him and he was like, whoa, like, like that, that was the curse, you know, that, that he was, and, and it ended up happening to the other guy. And, um, and then of course we heard, you know, that he died like terribly, like <clears throat> in the accident, like he was trapped in the vehicle and he burned up. <laughs> So That's it was, a, it was a terrible accident. Yeah. But I mean, you know, and so it, it would, could have been him. I mean, it could, you know, if he, if he would not have, you know, maybe, maybe this girl's prayers and, you know, interceded or whatever. And she was saying that that was her uh, cousin that did that. And she was like, he's a very evil person, you know? And, um, she was like, I'm worried that, you know, because he does practice magic, you know? Santa Muerta, you know, he was into all that. And she said that he was into all kinds of different stuff, you know, like he practiced different types of magic. And so, um, I had never had a problem with that guy. Like he would always come in there and he was pretty mild natured, but, uh, sure enough, when it came to some girl, you know, he started flipping out and trying to be tough guy and, and then turned into, you know, a big, uh, conflagration there at the club and, he issued all these threats, you know, and, and like, you know, saying that he was going to put a curse on him. He goes, you don't know me, you know, I'm going to put a curse on you. And we were all like, you know, well, we'll see what happens. And well, yeah, we saw, what, <laughs> we saw what happened. And, you know, as weird as that is, it's not even the weirdest thing that's happened. Like, I mean, as far as like being cursed, I think one of the worst curses would be to have a, a werewolf on you. <laughs> it would have to be like yeah. in the top one or two. The other one being something falls off of you, you know, that you need, 
that would be a pretty bad one. I think the werewolf would be right behind that one. But dying in a horrible car accident in the top five uh, for sure. So just just when you start your cult, Nathan, make sure the Nathanites know what they're playing with. Okay, make sure that they know what they're doing, uh, so those curses don't boomerang back on you guys, man. So, well, you know, to all those Nathanites out there, give it up. Don't touch the board. Um, I, I hate to rain on your prey, but the Nathanite rope has retired, so <laughs> I, I'm done with that thing. <laughs> it's a very short-lived cult. Jeez, the duration of the hour and whatever minutes we were together here. So <laughs> maybe it's a Guinness record. Nathan started a cult and he ended it on the same night. So anyways, folks, for you guys out there listening, uh, thanks for tuning in. And Nate, thanks to our guest, uh, Nathan Samora, a very nice guy. I've been friends with him for a while on Facebook. And um, he's a very uh, pumped guy, works out, eats his Wheaties, and no longer plays with a Ouija board. That's right. That's right. Yep. Stay clean, stay healthy for whatever tree you've been uh, been cornered up in by your curse from the dog man, uh, whatever witch is, is stewing you up in the cauldron and you can't escape, good night. <laughs> <laughs>